Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 3. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about John the Baptist, the baptism, the baptism of Jesus, and Luke's account of the genealogy of Jesus. Verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Atureia, and Tacrinitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood, excuse me, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to Yochanan, that's John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He came into all the region around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, or Yeshiahu the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley will, will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will be made straight and the rough ways smooth. All flesh will see God's salvation. Now, if you uh, actually, this is a, uh, a quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 and 5. So Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. If you go there, you will see that it's not a verbatim quote. And this is very, very important to understand. When we got New Testament writings quoting in a so-called Old Testament passage, it's not always verbatim quote, okay? Uh, in fact, most of the time, it's not a word-for-word -word quote, but rather just a uh, more like a paraphrased quote. And this is what trips people some, uh, some people up because some of the quotes and some of the um, uh, lingo that's used in the New Testament is found in some of the apocryphal works, uh, actually a lot of the apocryphal books, uh, including the book of Enoch. And I know that some of you are tripped up by that as well, that, uh, you know, well, you know, the uh, Jude's quote from the book of Enoch is not verbatim, it's not word for word, it's different. That's just the way it goes. That's just the way it is in the uh, in this in in these particular manuscripts. You don't find word for word quotes. They just do it. Um, they quote almost like a paraphrase quote. It's very important to understand that, uh, and you'll see more and more as you as you study the scriptures, and you know especially when you get into like the extra biblical works, like the apocryphal works. The books like the Book of Enoch and the book is, you know, the Book of Jubilees and, and so on and so forth. You know, a lot of people try to justify the different, you know, even when it comes to, for example, there are a few things, let's say, in, in the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles that are just slightly different. And I know this, some people got a lot, you know, theories about why, is the, the, you know, they, they say that this is 100% verbatim, you know, letter to letter correct, and so is this verbatim letter to letter correct, but then they, they make it, they make it work somehow. No, that's, they, you shouldn't do that. You should just look at it for what it is, Okay. Uh, some passages don't claim to be a perfect word-for-word, -word, letter for letter quote. Okay? They don't claim to be that. Uh, and that's not the way it is uh, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the old manuscripts and in the culture back in those days. You know, every one of these books were written by Jewish people. Uh, and the Jewish people in, in general uh, don't necessarily focus so much on every single word or legalistically speaking every single letter as they as they focus on more of the content or the the spirit of that letter okay for example in the book of psalms the word psalms means songs okay they're actually supposed to be sung uh in a lot of english and uh, no a lot of different other uh, languages today a lot of the so songs are rhyming, okay? They make it sound pretty by rhyming one verse to another verse, and it rhymes and rhymes and rhymes, and, you know, and then you get, a, you get a song. Well, if you read the book of Psalms, 
it's not word rhyming they do, but it's it's more like spirit rhyming they do. It's more like they take a precept or a concept and they just rhyme that concept over and over verse after verse in the Psalms. They say the same thing in a different way uh, or they take one particular uh, point that, that they want to say uh, in one particular point of that verse and they rhyme that point. They don't rhyme... Um, you know, f phonetically speaking, uh, the sound of words, but they rhyme the meaning of words, okay? Uh, so it's more important to understand that um, the meaning of words is more important than the actual letter-by-letter -letter legalistic kind of view is, okay? Um, so, verse 7. He said, therefore, to the multitudes who, who went out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers! This is John the Baptist speaking. Offspring of vipers, what does that mean? That means you are children of serpents. In other words, children of devils. Okay? Uh, vipers means serpents, means snakes, which, it, which are, a, a snake in the scripture is a symbol of a devil. Okay? The serpent came to Eve in the garden. That was the devil or Satan himself in the book of Revelation. The serpent, what is the devil? Okay, so Zechariah, or excuse me, Zechariah's son, Yehokanan, John, John the Baptist, his message was not a, oh, God loves you, God has great graces to you kind of message. No, you offspring of vipers, you are children of devils. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who? That's hot. Why is that hot? Because John, people were coming to him saying, we, want, we, we repent, we want to be forgiven, we want God to forgive us. Most pastors today, most bishops today, most priests today would say, oh, come on into the church. It's so good that you've come. Oh, you know, you can, God forgives you. God understands. The grace of God is on you. God loves you. Nope. That's not the way John the Baptist dealt with it. These people came to him for repent, to, to be baptized for repentance. They were more or less saying to him, we repent, baptize us. He's like, you are a brood of serpents. You are a brood of de devils. You are children of devils. Who warns you to, to flee from the wrath to come? In other words, you are not even worthy to hear the message of repentance. A lot of you today, you know, you, you see some guys out on the street corner holding up signs saying repent and, they, and they're yelling at people telling them repent. You better be glad that they do that because a lot of these people don't even, they're not even worthy to hear that message. Okay, you better be thankful. You better fall on your face and thank God that somebody is warning you to, to repent, warning, of you, warning you of your sin. Instead of being so proud that you get angry with them or say, well, that kind of thing doesn't work or whatever. So many spoiled brats today in, adults, in adult bodies. Because a lot of these people that are being warned of the wrath to come by, by a lot of street preachers, street preachers today, quite honestly, they, they, they're not even worthy to hear that message. They should be extremely grateful. These indeed children of devils. Verse 8, therefore produce fruits worthy of repentance. What does that mean? That means don't just come say, I'm sorry, I repent. No, do repentance. Work it out. Prove that you've repented. A lot of people say, oh, I've changed. Oh, so-and-so, they, they've turned over a new leaf. Oh, yeah? Really? Prove it. It takes time. It takes time. No one can come to you and say, oh, I'm sorry, I repented. Do what John the Baptist said. Say, you're a brood of, you're, you're children of devils. Who, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You don't even deserve to hear the message. Produce fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, 
Prove it by your lifestyle. Prove it by the way you talk, by the way you walk, by the way you dress, by the way you, by the way you uh, live. Prove it that you've repented. John said, don't begin, don't even begin to say among yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. You understand? A lot of people would say today, I mean, in, in, a, in the Jewish point of view, be like, oh yeah, we are children of Abraham, we are Jews. Well, in the Christian point of view, they would say, oh, we, we're Christians, we go to church, we go to the, the conferences. We're children of God. John the Baptist says, don't even begin to say that. God is able to raise up children from stones. God is, ra is able to raise up children to him for, from the stones that are on the ground. And you think you're, you're so good? You're not. Prove it. Prove it. Verse 9, even now the axe also lies at the root of the trees. Okay. Every tree, therefore, that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That means you have to prove you've repented by your fruit. It takes time for fruit to grow. It takes time. You have to prove that you have truly repented by your fruit. A lot of people would say, oh, I'm sorry, I've sinned. And then they go ahead and do the, same, do the same thing again. Oh, I'm sorry, I've sinned. They go ahead and do the same thing again. Year after year after year, they do the same thing again. That's not repentance. They haven't repented. Not at all. Verse 10, the multitudes asked him, what then must we do? Now, it's, I find this kind of amazing because these guys were very harshly rebuked, rebuked, okay? They were called children of devils. They were challenged saying, you, think, you say you repent? You say you're sorry? Prove it. Prove it by your works. They didn't get angry. They said to him, what then must we do? So John said, he who has two coats, let him give to the one who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. And this is really just what the, the law of God teaches, just to deny yourself and to help other people. Uh, don't be selfish. You know, and a lot of people today, they're so caught up in their own selfish life, lifestyle and their own selfish lusts. We've got parades today that parade around very abominable stuff. These people are very selfish. They are not um, out to, to help people, to help the poor. Uh, they're not out to give to people. They're out to take what they can take. Uh, it's very, very un, you know, unfortunate, especially that people actually support these people. Uh, verse 12. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what must we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than, than that which is appointed to you. Okay, Because they were known for collecting too much, ripping people off, basically thieves. Uh, verse 14, Soldiers also asked him, Say, What about us? What must we do? What, what, what must we do? And he said to them, Extort from no one by violence, neither accuse anyone wrongfully. Be content with your wages. Verse 15, as the people were in expectation and all men reasoned in their hearts concerning Yochanan, whether perhaps he was the Christ or the Messiah, Yochanan answered them all. He said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he but he comes who is mightier than I, the strap who, of whose sandals I'm not worthy to loosen. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor and will gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, uh, John here is preaching about Jesus coming, judging people to hell. 
That's what he's talking about here. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay? Fire, speaking of death, um, whose fan is in his hand, fanning the fire, fanning the flames of hell, cleansing the threshing floor, meaning cleansing the, the earth, okay? Uh, and will gather the wheat into his barn. That's the good people. I know almost everybody thinks they're good, and probably even the most evil people that ever lived on earth you know, thought they were good. But we got to look into the scriptures. We got to look into the law of God, the guidelines, the standards that we see in the scriptures to whether or not we are really good according to those standards without trying to justify yourself, okay? Don't justify yourself. He will gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, that's talking about the unquenchable forever torments of hell. Verse 18. Then, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, uh, a Tetrarch, it says here in the, in, the, in the notes, is one of four governors of a province, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things which Herod had done, added this also to them all, that he shut up John in prison. Okay. Now the note here by brother's wife also says that the TR, the Textus Receptus, also uh, reads brother Philip's instead of just brother. So brother Philip's wife. Uh, for all the evil things which Herod had done, uh, added this also to them all, that he shuts up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, baptized, Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. The sky was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove on him. And a voice came out of the sky, saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It says the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove on him. It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit actually was a dove or a dove actually lit on him. It doesn't say that. It says he descended in a bodily form like a dove, okay? Uh, so whether an, it, he may not have even appeared like a, as a dove, but rather he, the mannerisms of the Spirit uh, descending on Jesus was like a dove. I say that because we see so many different symbol, symbols of the Spirit of God as, uh, as a dove. Uh, and a lot of people think that it was actually a, a dove. It's not. No. Uh, the Spirit of God was like, just like a dove. Okay. If I say to you that somebody is like a lion, it doesn't mean that they appear like a lion that they are in mannerism like a lion. Verse 23, Jesus himself, when he began to teach, was about 30 years old, being the son, as was supposed, of Yosef, the son of Haley, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Yane, the son of Yosef, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of El. Uh, Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maat, the son of Matathias, the son of Simein, the son of Yosef, the son of Yehuda, the son of Yohanan. That's John. Again, John. Even though we don't see it in um, in the Old Testament like that, it the, the name John is in the Old Testament, just in a different form. Okay, um, so the Yo Yohanan, Yohanan here is John, the son of Reze, Reza, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Na N N Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Chosam, the son of Almodam, the son of Er, the son of Yose, the son of Eliezer, the son of Jorim, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Yehuda, the son of Yosef, the son of Yo Yon, again, this is probably John, Yohanan. Yonan, the son of Eliakim, the son of Meli, the son of Menon, the son of M Matata, or yeah, Matata, the son of Nathan, 
the son of Dawid, or David, the son of Yeshe, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, Nashon the son of Aminidab, the son of Aram. Uh, it says here, the NU script, uh, manuscripts reads Ad, Admin, or Admin, and the son of Arni instead of Ar Aram. So this, uh, that's Aram, or Aram. The son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Yehuda, the son of Yaakov, the son of Yitzhak, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arpachsad, the son of Shem, the son of Noach, the son of Lamech, the son of Ma um, Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Shet, the son of Adam, the son of God. Awesome, 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 awesome. So, uh, this is worth noting as well, um, that this particular genealogy is different than the one we read in Matthew. Now, there is a consensus among many churches that one of these uh, genealogies is of Miriam and one is of Yosef. Um, and it says, uh, uh, it speaks of Yosef um, uh, being this, uh, excuse me here, if you go back to verse 23, talking about Jesus being the son of Yosef, uh, the explanation is that uh, it was, he was actually biologically the son of Mary, but since Yosef was the husband of Mary, he belonged to Yosef. And he was like, as of Yosef's son. Um, however, uh, you need to know that you need to know that there are different points of view of why that these genealogies are different. I will at another future time, uh, be talking about that, this particular subject in much more detail, uh, which genealogy is which and, and how, uh, you know, more of a broader explanation, uh, more of an ex, you know, just expounding upon the genealogy differences between Matthew and Luke. So I'm going to do that in another different teaching. So again, as you uh, as you go and as you think about the scriptures that were read here, may God bless you, enlighten the eyes of your understanding, give you great wisdom, lead you and guide you, not only to know, not only to speak, but to actually do God's will according to the scriptures according to his guidelines, instructions, and according to his rules. You want God to rule over you? You got to go by his rules. Again, thanks for watching and God bless.